Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another serial killer spotlight video. Now I really didn't know what series to include this video in this month. Is it a mystery, a history or a serial killer? I asked on Instagram and Twitter and the overwhelming response was that it should come under my serial killer spotlight series. So that's what I'm doing but it's actually a little bit of a strange one because Charles Manson never actually murdered anyone himself as far as we know anyway. 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the infamous Manson family murders, so you've probably seen Charles Manson everywhere in recent months, with the release of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, season 2 of Mindhunter, and multiple new documentaries dropping about the crimes, I figured it was about time that I shared the story for you guys as well. But before we get into this week's video, I would just like to thank Magellan TV for sponsoring once again. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming site with hundreds of documentaries about a huge range of different topics. I love documentaries and I'm sure if you're watching this video, you're probably the kind of person who loves documentaries as well and I really cannot recommend Magellan TV enough. They have everything from true crime, to science, to history, nature, and everything in between, and new programs are added weekly that can be watched anywhere, on your TV, laptop, and mobile. It's compatible with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play, and iOS, and loads of the programs are available in 4K. They actually have a couple of documentaries on Charles Manson that I watched whilst I was researching for today's video, and I would highly recommend you check them out too. I'm not being overdramatic when I say that Manson 40 Years Later may be the best documentary I have ever watched and I really truly mean that. I also watched Half-Life A Journey to Chernobyl as well last night too if you're fancying something a little bit more sciencey. As always with these videos I'm going to take a deep dive into Manson himself. I'm going to look at his childhood and formative years before talking about his crimes. And I feel like this should be said, my serial killer videos are not glamorising these criminals in any way, which you'll quickly realise if you watch any of these videos. It's about education. You can't ignore the dark side of history just because it's dark. It's just as important to learn about things like this than it is anything else. Charles Manson was born in Cincinnati, Ohio on November 12th, 1934 as Charles Miles Maddox, taking his mother's surname. It's not thought that he ever knew his father, but it appears he may have been a man called Colonel Scott. Not an army colonel, that was just his name. Kathleen Maddox was just 16 years old when she gave birth to Charles and when she told Colonel that she was pregnant, he disappeared pretty sharpish. But shortly before Charles was born, she meets a man called William Manson, whose name Charles eventually takes. But Manson was a heavy drinker and would just disappear for days at a time, leading to his and Kathleen's divorce just a couple of years later. But Kathleen herself wasn't exactly an angel either. She had her own alcohol problems and would often go missing for days at a time herself, leaving a young Charles either on his own or with a variety of different babysitters. Eventually, in 1939, Kathleen is arrested for armed robbery, although she was just using a bottle of ketchup as a fake gun, and she's given a 10-year prison sentence. Four-year-old Charles is sent to live with his aunt and uncle in West Virginia, and Kathleen is paroled five years later and Charles goes back to live with her, but Charles, at just nine years old, has already begun his life of crime by this point. He's skipping school, he's shoplifting, his cousin said that he would constantly lie and display violent behaviour. Charles described his first few weeks as being back with his mum as the happiest time of his life, but things soon took a downward turn. His mother continued drinking and he continued stealing and skipping school. And his mother didn't really want to deal with it and she begins looking for foster homes to place him in. But she has no luck, so eventually decides to send him to the Gibbalt or Gibbalt School for Boys in Indiana, which was a school for male delinquents. It was very strict, run by Roman Catholic priests, where punishment for even the tiniest step out of line would be a beating. This would be the first of many years spent in institutions for little Charlie Manson. Soon, Charlie escapes from Gibbalt and runs back home, probably expecting that his mother would be happy to see him, but she swiftly sends him back. Now don't misunderstand, Kathleen loved her son, but she struggled with her own demons and spent more time with them than she did with Charlie. He spends Christmas that year at his aunt and uncle's house where he basically grew up and he's caught stealing a gun. Clearly this school wasn't having the desired effect. 
After 10 months at Gibbalt, Charlie has had enough and decides to run away again. But this time he knows better than to return home to his mother, so he runs to Indianapolis instead. Here he commits his first serious crime when he robs a grocery store. With the money he steals, he rents a room and buys food. He's still a child at this point, just 13 years old. He tries to get a job, but continues his petty theft on the side to supplement his income. One day he pushes his burglary too far and gets caught being picked up by the police. The police realise that this boy is a runaway and he becomes responsibility of the courts rather than sending him home to his mother and the court sent him to Boys Town in Omaha, Nebraska which was the most famous juvenile facility in the USA. It had a reputation for really turning these difficult boys around but just four days after he arrives him and another boy called Blackie Nielsen steal a car and drive to Illinois where Blackie had an uncle. Pretty much as soon as they arrive in Illinois, they commit armed robberies for money. So just two weeks later, he's back in police custody once again, and they're quick to link him to the armed robberies that had taken place a couple of weeks beforehand. This time, the judge isn't as easy on him, and he's packed off to a reform school, the Indiana Boys School, and it was unlike Gibbalt. The boys here at Indiana Boys School were fully-fledged criminals. Little Charlie Manson was a beginner compared to most of the boys in there. It was regimented, it was strict, and it was designed to turn lives around with use of physical punishment when it was deemed to be appropriate. Charlie later said that he was almost immediately raped by other students as soon as he arrived. Charlie got through life to this point by being somewhat of a con man, a con child, I suppose. He would use his wit and manipulation to get his own way, but that wouldn't work at the boys' school. Instead, he had to be on constant guards, living in fear of being beaten or sexually assaulted at all times. Over the years, he makes multiple attempts to escape from the school, most of which are unsuccessful. But in October 1949, he does manage to escape, only to be picked up 12 hours later by police, who catch him trying to break in to a gas station. But in 1951, Charlie is now 16 years old. He teams up with two other 16-year-olds, and together they sneak off from the school, stealing a car. They managed to evade capture for three days before they eventually got caught but they'd actually driven over state lines in a stolen vehicle, which was a federal offence. And all three boys are sentenced to the National Training School for Boys in Washington, DC. And so they were shipped off to remain there until they're 21 years old. Now, the National Training School wasn't actually as bad as the boys' reform school, and Charlie was given time with a psychiatrist who noted that he was manipulative, that he would likely try and become dominant in the school, given his time at the reform school. His IQ was noted as being above average, although he was actually barely literate, he couldn't read or write, and he excelled particularly in music classes, whilst being described as aggressively antisocial. Eventually, he's recommended to move to the nearby minimum security Natural Bridge Honor Camp, where only the best and most well-behaved students would be transferred to. Charles was neither of those things, but his psychiatrist thought it would give him the self-confidence that he lacked. It's actually kind of funny to think of Charlie Manson's having little self-confidence, but that seems to have been the case. Eventually, his family tried to get him parole, thinking that six years in institutions at this point may have changed his ways. All he had to do was stay out of trouble until his parole hearing in February of 1952. But he couldn't do it, and he's caught sodomising another student whilst holding a razor blade to the student's throat. So he's not released, and now 17 years old, he's transferred once again to the Federal Reformatory in Virginia. Once there, he's considered a dangerous inmate, and he regularly brings harm on the other inmates. So once again, he's transferred out to a different reformatory. He's considered to be beyond rehabilitating, an unchangeable criminal who shouldn't and wouldn't be trusted in society, and he wasn't going to be released until his 21st birthday in 1955. But then something strange happened. By the autumn of 1952, Charlie had stopped being a danger in prison. He spent all of 1953 working on his academics and he learnt to read and he worked in the facility's transportation unit, doing maintenance work on vehicles. 
At age 19, he was considered fully reformed and he's released from the institution. He spent seven years in six different schools by this point, not prisons per se, but reformatories, and they may as well have been prisons. He goes to live with family members, still not able to live with Kathleen, and he gets a job at a local racetrack. But through years spent in institutions, he lacked the social skills needed to fully function in society. He didn't know how to talk to people, particularly people his own age, and more particularly, girls. His grandmother, who he lived with for a period, actually made him attend church every single week with her and she forced him to attend Sunday school. His grandmother thought that this would be where he was able to make friends, but he doesn't really know how. He goes into Sunday school and brags to these devout Christian children about his time in reform school, about his crime and fights and drugs. He genuinely thought that this would impress them, but of course it didn't. And parents almost immediately banned their children from befriending Charlie Manson. So he was not popular, but he eventually meets a girl called Rosalie Willis. He clearly charms her and soon they begin to date and people were really shocked. Rosalie was the town's popular girl and Charlie was universally disliked by pretty much everyone in town, but she clearly liked dating the bad boy. Just a few months later, they were married with Charlie aged just 20. And there's actually a bit of debate about Rosalie's age. She put 17 on the marriage certificate, but it's thought that she may have actually been a couple of years younger than that. Um, Charlie and Rosalie rent a place and Charlie picks up an extra part-time job to support them. He begins to make some friends and he buys a guitar. But after a few months, he begins to get bored. Why does he need to work so hard and still struggle to pay his bills? Rosalie was pregnant by this point, which meant there were medical bills and supplies and just more expenses that they couldn't afford. So he turns back to crime. He starts stealing cars from the other side of the river and he sells them on in other states. Eventually he decides that he wants to go see his mother who moved to California after the breakdown of her marriage. So Charlie and Rosalie drive all the way to Los Angeles in another stolen car and they begin to set up their life there. Only soon enough, he's arrested for stealing the car he drove there. Once again, crossing state lines in a stolen vehicle is a federal offence, only this time he's no longer a juvenile. Luckily for him, he got a lenient judge and after begging to stay out of jail, saying that he was still adjusting after spending his adolescence in reformatories, and he tells the judge he's got this pregnant wife at home and that he wants to see his child grow up, he's just sentenced to five years probation. But he's also awaiting sentencing on a different charge at this point of driving a stolen car from Ohio to Florida at one point whilst he was stealing and selling to different states. It was likely that he would have just got more years of probation on top of this, but he panics and he runs with Rosalie to Indianapolis. There she gives birth to the couple's son, Charles Manson Jr. Soon after though, Charlie is arrested for running. This time he's officially an adult and too old for reformatories and he's sent to his first adult prison, San Pedro Terminal Island Penitentiary in Los Angeles. But in terms of prisons, this is actually a pretty tame one full of non-violent offenders. So Charlie doesn't really have much of a difficult time there. He actually learns a lot from his other inmates. He learns how to further master his skills as a manipulator and a criminal. He learns how to bend people to his will. And he's also a model prisoner. That is until one day when Rosalie suddenly stops coming to visit. She moved out of the apartment that she'd been sharing with Kathleen in Los Angeles and she moves in with another man, taking their son with her and she soon starts divorce proceedings. Charlie was actually really close to being released from prison on parole at this point, but Rosalie leaving him led to him acting out and attempting to escape. Eventually, he's released on September 30th, 1958, after two and a half years in prison, and he goes straight to live with his mother. He struggled to get a job due to his criminal history, and he was required to check in with his parole officer regularly. But now, he thinks he's found his calling in life. He's decided he's going to become a pimp. 
He's learned from other inmates in prison about how they made their living off being pimps and they've given him all of the tricks of the trade. He wanted to be his own boss and this is how he was gonna do it. So he starts hiring these girls and selling them for sex, but it actually gets off to a very bad start when the father of one of his girls called the police on him. So he makes the decision that from then on, none of the girls he hired were allowed to have contact with their family. They all had to be estranged from their families. And eventually things start working out for him and his business and he moves out of his mother's apartment. But he actually moves in with another pimp who was being watched by the FBI, which doesn't exactly look great for Charles himself still being on probation. His parole officer gives him a word of warning. Now after a while, he's arrested once again, this time for forging a check. But one of his girls actually goes to the court and tells them that she's pregnant with Charles's child and that they're going to get married and they're going to live a happy life together. Of course, this wasn't true, but the judge takes pity and Charlie is simply given a 10 year suspended sentence and continued probation. He does actually eventually end up marrying this girl though, she's called Leona, but not for love or any reason like that. He gets into trouble once again, this time for transporting women across state lines for the purpose of prostitution, and he knows that Leona won't be able to testify against him if they're married. And so they get married, and she does actually end up falling pregnant by him. But Charlie skips town and now Leona is pregnant and alone and she's facing her own prison sentence for prostitution. In her own best interest, she goes to the police and tells them that Charlie was indeed transporting her for the purpose of prostitution and so a warrant is issued for his arrest. At this point, he's 26 years old, he's captured and he's ordered to serve his 10 year suspended sentence at the United States Penitentiary at McNeil Island, Washington. And he's transferred there in July 1961. There was no chance of him being able to escape from this particular prison. As the name suggests, McNeil Island, it's an island surrounded by water. But he does continue his schooling in prison though and he takes guitar lessons and he becomes very interested in Scientology. Not so much for the religion, but he really takes on its teachings. Charlie still had ambitions to be a pimp at this point once he left prison and he really believed that that's what his life's calling was. And Scientology taught him a lot of skills that he could use in this particular career choice. It taught him how to take traumatic life events and move past them, how to free yourself of old fears and move forward towards a brighter, more spiritual future. These weren't things that Charles wanted to learn for himself though. He took on how to use this information to teach other people. What he actually learned were recruitment techniques, ways that he could manipulate these mostly downtrodden girls into doing his bidding. It was also in prison at this point that he heard of the Beatles for the first time and he was just in awe of them. Not only did he love the Beatles songwriting, he thought it was incredible just how much of the world fell at their feet. And Charlie could sing and play guitar himself. He started going around telling people that he was gonna become bigger than the Beatles. He truly, truly believed that. He would spend every moment from then on with his guitar hunched over playing and writing songs. Now once again, when he's in prison, to no surprise, his wife Leona files for a divorce and she reportedly has a son herself who she also calls Charles. Charlie is released on the 21st of March, 1967, after more than six years in prison. He didn't want to leave. He actually begged the authorities to let him stay in prison, saying that he didn't understand how to function in normal society. By the time of his release, he was 32 years old and he'd spent more than half his life in institutions, in and out since he was 13 years old. In the years Charlie had been in prison, things had been changing on the outside world and hippie culture had begun to rise. It was an entirely different world to what Charles had been used to. People fighting in the streets for social change. There were men with long hair and women in jeans. People were fighting to live freer lives outside the constraints of money and work and the government. And this really appealed to Charles because it meant that these people would be free to follow him. These hippies that Charlie would meet in the street didn't care that he'd served jail time. To them, it meant that he'd been sticking it to the authorities. He was a rebel. And they wanted to hear his stories about prison and what happened on the inside, and he delivered. And there was also the hippie free love movement. Love whoever you want, when you want. And that did kind of put an end to Charlie's dreams of being a pimp. 
why would people pay for sex when people were just willing to do it for free? When he was released from prison, the first place Charlie headed to was actually at San Francisco, one of the hubs of hippie culture at the time. He didn't want to get a job, he considered himself above the kind of menial jobs that would usually be offered to an ex-con. He wanted to be a musician, and that was that. In San Francisco, he's meeting all these people on the streets, all these free hippie people, and he soon meets 23-year-old Mary Brenner, who actually worked at Berkeley as a librarian. Now, she was new to the area from Wisconsin, she was lonely, she had no friends, and Charlie could always tell when a girl was lonely. He works his magic with her. He says how he's got nowhere to go, nowhere to live, and so she offers him her sofa for a few nights. And soon, he's staying in her bed. Mary really appealed to him because he was meeting all these free love hippie girls on the street, and then he meets Mary, who's this quiet, shy, conservative girl from Wisconsin who's just moved to San Francisco. She's got no friends and he knows that he can use that to his advantage. She was easily swayed and Charlie had a great deal. He had no bills to pay, no rent to pay. He had a beautiful girl and he had freedom to just roam around Berkeley and play his guitar. He would even bring back other girls to Mary's apartment, believing in this whole free love movement. Charlie roamed around the streets of San Francisco, relishing in the freedom from incarceration. He loaned a car from someone and drove down to Venice, Los Angeles, which was a place full of artists and musicians. It's here that he actually meets 18-year-old Lynette from for the first time, and he meets her while she's sitting on a bench, crying. Charlie senses her weakness and he makes his move. Lynette had spent a huge amount of her childhood singing and dancing on TV, but she turned to sex and drugs as part of her teenage rebellion. She attempted suicide twice in high school and she was a pretty troubled girl. And that was the exact kind of girl that Charlie Manson could manipulate. He tells her of his time in prison, how you have to break free of your mental and physical constraints. Fate had brought them together, he says, and so he takes Lynette home to Mary. Lynette would actually later be known as Squeaky, an integral part of the Manson family. One day, Charlie, Mary and Lynette drive to Los Angeles once again to meet one of Charlie's acquaintances from prison. This man introduces Charlie to a girl called Pat Krenwinkel. Pat was also a teenager, having a difficult time, her parents were divorcing and she was really unhappy with her living situation. Charlie pounces, saying all of the right things to Pat and he ends up making love to her that same day. And she ends up leaving with Charlie, Mary and Lynn. The Manson family was beginning to form and over the next few months, the four of them would go off on camping trips, sleeping in the VW bus that Charlie had acquired. They would build campfires, they'd play guitar, they'd drink and do drugs. Charlie's manipulation of these girls ran very, very deep from the very beginning. He would take them into the woods and make them stand up against trees whilst he would throw knives over their heads. If they flinched, he said, it meant that they didn't trust him. So they would do everything they could to stand perfectly still while Charlie is throwing knives at them. And all the praise they would get from Charlie afterwards would make it all worth it. He would make them feel so loved and so wanted, something that they'd never had in their life before. It doesn't take long for 20 year old Susan Atkins to come to Charlie. Her mother had died five years earlier and Susan had been left to look after her younger brother and her father. She felt pushed aside and ignored by everyone and she'd also tried to commit suicide. And then along comes Charlie, giving her all of the acceptance and attention that she desired. They have sex and he tells her that many girls have guilty sexual feelings about their fathers and she just needed to break free of that. He's going to help her. She just needs to imagine that she's having sex with her father when she's having sex with him. He tells her to come with him. She can be a part of a real family. And from that moment on, she vows to follow him for the rest of her life. So Charlie's just got this family of girls following him around at all times. And he slowly starts to ask them to have sex with other men as part of the whole free love thing. But really, it was just so he could remind them that he had complete control over them at all times. They were going to do as he said. Charlie preached equality, that everyone had power over their own lives, that everyone had complete freedom. 
But in reality, he dominated all of them without a single one of them actually realizing it. Mary eventually falls pregnant with Charlie's baby and then another girl falls pregnant in the coming months, but they're not entirely sure who the father is of this second baby. With this growing family, he swaps out his VW bus for an old yellow school bus. He hoped to continue adding to his family, focusing on men next. And he decided that the place he was gonna be able to do that was Los Angeles. So he gets his parole transferred from San Francisco to LA. He is convinced that he's going to turn up in LA and he's going to get a recording contract as soon as he arrives. He wanted to be famous, that's all he wanted, but he told his family that he actually wanted to just teach the world a better way to live through his songs. He wanted to make the world a better place, he told them, it had nothing to do with fame. So almost immediately as he arrives in LA, he manages to get a meeting with a man called Gary Stromberg at Universal. And so he takes all four girls with him to this meeting. Stromberg would later remember how all the girls just stood there watching Charlie, waiting for a signal as to what they should be doing. At one point, Charlie actually gets Lynette to kiss his shoes and she immediately does, no questions asked. But once she does it, Charlie also gets down on his knees and kisses Lynette's shoes back. But Stromberg stressed that it didn't seem to be out of fear, Lynette didn't kiss his shoes because she was scared. It seemed to be admiration. Um, Stromberg actually granted Charlie a three hour studio session, but it was just a complete disaster. He told Charlie to go off and work on his music and come back to him with no intention of actually ever entertaining this again. But to Charlie, this just meant that Gary didn't understand his music on that deep level. And that Charlie didn't want studio monkeys telling him how to sing his songs anyway he was going to do it his own way. Once in LA, they have to find a place to live. The bus was nice enough, but it didn't have any cleaning facilities, any hygiene facilities, and the girls moaned about it. So they eventually find lodgings in Topanga Canyon, where Charlie meets a man called Bobby Beausoleil, and the two immediately become friends, feeling like kindred spirits. Charlie notices that Bobby also has a few girls following him around at all times, hanging onto his every word. But this was actually probably because Bobby was a very good looking man rather than any kind of manipulation skills. Charlie knew that if he could get Bobby on his side, then his family could grow exponentially. Bobby and Charlie actually form a band together called the Milky Ways and Bobby introduces Charlie to a man called Gary Hinman, who was a music teacher. Charlie works his magic on Gary and the two quickly become friends as well. It's around this time that a 14 year old called Diane Lake joins the family along with Ruth Ann Morehouse who was a teenager Charlie had had his eye on for a really long time. When he summons Ruth, tells her to come and join him, she drops her entire life immediately. Her entire family, her husband, and runs to join Manson. At this point, Manson is employing more family members by the day and it's also growing by the birth of his children. Mary eventually gives birth to a baby boy named Valentine Michael Manson. His birth certificate just said Michael Manson though. But Charlie didn't believe in the establishment. Names and birth dates and details were just insignificant. Everyone called the boy Pooh Bear. In fact, everyone in the family had nicknames, or pretty much everyone. Barely anybody went by their birth name. Charlie preached that to belong to the family, you had to be free. Give up your personal belongings, your birthday, and your name. Most of the time, Charlie would pick out their new, quirkier names naturally. There was Squeaky, Gypsy, Lulu, Snake. Ella Bailey becomes Cinderella. Pat Kremwinkle becomes Kate. Susan Atkins was Sadie Glutz. It was just another way for Manson to control, to strip away their identities and provide a new, free identity. These girls weren't even allowed to parent their own children. Charlie thought that biological parents would most likely be the ones to mess up their own children, so all of the children would be raised with everyone as their caregiver. The children often didn't know who their actual mothers were, they were all their mothers. The famous band of the 60s, the Beach Boys, also had a strange association with Manson. Pat and Ella went out hitchhiking one day in late spring of 1968 and they were picked up by none other than Dennis Wilson who was a drummer and one of the founding members of the Beach Boys. Since his failure at Universal, Charlie had been looking for a different kind of musical sponsor. Somebody in the industry but not necessarily the bigwig kind. Dennis Wilson invites Pat and Ella back to his home for a drink and a snack. 
and they accept they gush to Wilson about their saviour, Charlie Manson. And they had no idea who Dennis Wilson was, but they then go back to the family and they tell Charlie of this guy they just met. And Charlie, of course, knew who he was. And so he tells the girls to immediately take him back to Wilson's house. When Wilson arrives home that night, Charlie is there waiting at the house, waving and smiling like an old friend. And Wilson is obviously very unnerved by this. He asks Charlie if he's going to hurt him. And Charlie replies, do I look like I'm going to? Before dropping to his knees and kissing Dennis's feet. Dennis Wilson goes into his home and the entirety of the family were just waiting in his home, making themselves at home, and thus begins their friendship. The two of them, Charlie and Dennis, were very similar, free-spirited with crazy ideas about the world. Manson was interesting to be around and he shared his drugs, mostly LSD, and the many, many women who were happy to satisfy every single one of Dennis's sexual desires. So in return, Dennis starts introducing Charlie to his industry friends. And something you have to bear in mind about Charlie is that he didn't come across as creepy or psychotic. He was intense, sure, but it was the interesting kind of intense, where you could spend hours having deep conversations about the universe. People were really fascinated with him and therefore they tended to give him the time of day that he wanted. Um, Wilson also let the family pretty much move into his home. They spent the entire summer of 1968 in his home whilst he paid for the entire family, food, medical bills, damages to his property. Wilson also introduced Charlie, somebody who would go on to become one of the most notorious Manson family murders, a man called Charles Watson. Charles Watson would later go on to be known as Tex. Tex was from a small town in, you guessed it, Texas, and he was the high school football star popular, good looking, he did well at school. He wasn't the kind of person who you would expect to be won over by somebody like Manson. But Tex had moved out to California to become a movie star and that just wasn't happening for him. So Tex picked up a hitchhiking Wilson one day who invites him back to his home and the rest is history. One of Wilson's friends that Charlie particularly wanted to impress was a 26 year old man called Terry Melcher who was an influential producer at Columbia Records and just happened to be the son of Doris Day. It should have been easy for Charlie to be signed by Melcher with Dennis Wilson's stamp of approval, but Melcher just simply wasn't impressed by him. Growing up the son of a star, it took a lot more than somebody complimenting and fawning over him in the way that Charlie did to win his trust. And Melcher didn't even listen to Charlie's music, but it was suggested that he makes a documentary about Manson and his followers. You see, it wasn't exactly a normal setup after all, and people were probably quite interested in this guy and his family or females. It was just a really, really interesting setup. And in fact, quite a few people ended up joining the family ranks who you wouldn't really expect. It wasn't all downtrodden girls who'd run away from home with poor mental health just wanting acceptance and approval. There were also high school homecoming queens and rich kids, the kind of kids who had everything they could ask for growing up. But the one thing they were all looking for, the one thing they all had in common, is that they wanted something to believe in and Charlie provided that. Terry Melcher lived at 10050 Celio Drive in Beverly Hills, California, an address that you will hear of again. It's unclear whether Manson actually ever entered his residence whilst he lived there, the sources very much vary on that, but in the end, Melcher heard Charlie audition and declined to sign him. But there was still talk of this documentary until Melcher actually witnessed Manson's temper. He witnessed Manson just beat somebody up and that put an end to that project. By the summer of 1969, it was clear that Charlie's dreams of Hollywood stardom were over. Eventually Melcher moves out of Celio Drive, telling very few people that he was moving and it's now leased to Roman Polanski and Sharon Tate. By summer, Dennis Wilson has had enough of Charlie and his family, and with his lease just about to end, he moves out of his house too, leaving his landlord to evict the family. I mean, that's one way to avoid an awkward confrontation, I suppose. But Wilson actually later takes one of Manson's own songs and recrafts it as Never Learn Not To Love, and he puts it on the Beach Boys 2020 album. He told Charlie that one of his songs was going to be on the album, but in the end it was reworked entirely and Wilson was credited as the sole composer on it. And as you can probably imagine, Charlie was 
furious and he actually threatens Wilson by giving him a single bullet and suggesting that he should be keeping his children safe. After being evicted from Wilson's house, the family turned to Spahn Ranch, which is now a name that's synonymous with the Manson family. The school bus had broken down and one of the girls said she knew somebody that could fix it. They lived on a ranch about 35 miles northwest of LA. And as soon as Charlie arrives at the ranch, he knows it's the place for his family. It was an old Western movie set, practically in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by acres, miles of nature. And whilst a lot of the set was just frontages, so just like fronts of buildings and nothing behind them, um, lots of the buildings were actual buildings as well. It was big enough for everyone to have their own space, but also confined enough for Charlie to maintain control. The ranch was owned by a man called George Spahn, who made his money by renting horses to visitors to go on trail rides in the surrounding nature. But George's vision was actually rapidly deteriorating, he was getting older, and the maintenance on the ranch was poor and it was falling into disrepair. So Charlie makes his pitch to George, let him and his family live on the ranch for free and they would help out with the trail rides, keep up with maintenance and keep the movie set clean. And George agrees to this and to ensure that he doesn't change his mind, Charlie immediately puts Lynn in George's house as a housekeeper and part of her job was to have sex with him, to satiate him. And she happily obliged, asking no questions. It was actually George who gave her the nickname of Squeaky, not Charlie. By this point, the family has grown exponentially. He first moved in 18 people into the ranch and within a couple of months, it's 35 men, women and children. It was once they'd settled in at the ranch that Charlie really begins to have complete control. They were isolated in the ranch, there were no outside influences to alert the girls to what Charlie was actually doing. Nor that anybody outside ever really did question what was going on. People were always just more intrigued about this strange following than concerned. Charlie bans the girls from carrying money on them. He never gives them an explanation, just tells them they're not allowed and so they oblige. When they go out, one of the men has to go with them and carry the money, very, very similar to pimps. Um, most food was taken out of large bins found at the back of stores and they would pose as charity workers or girl guides and get food given to them for free from supermarkets, which they would then take back to the ranch. Communal meals were cooked and everyone would share breakfast and dinner. There was no lunch. Mornings were for working. Everyone, apart from Charlie of course, had an equal share of work to do. Books weren't allowed because Charlie didn't trust that authors were enlightened in the same way he was, and neither were watches or glasses. Apparently, according to Charlie, whatever eyesight they had was how they were supposed to be seeing the world. A few times a week, Charlie would orchestrate LSD sessions where he would gather everyone together and personally place the drugs in each person's mouth, ensuring that he either took less than everyone else or none at all, so he could maintain complete control. As everyone's tripping, he would talk about his beliefs, about how he is Jesus and how he is the only person who really knows the truth. All of his teachings, he said, were interpretations of the Bible and he would defend it to them. He would then tell them to have sex with each other, men and women, men and men, women and women. And they would just do as he said, nobody ever questioned it. He believed that LSD made you learn who you really were. Apparently LSD freed you. He preached them often as if he was in church leading a service. He would play guitar and he would sing whilst the girls just swooned over him. Charlie cut off contact with the rest of the world as much as he could. He kept everyone isolated on the ranch, except when he demanded that the girls would have sex with outsiders. They didn't have a clue about the state of the world, apart from the stories that Charlie told them and they'd just believe it. And he really did spin some tales of this violence happening all across the country, across the world. He would send off family members on what they would call creepy crawls, which basically mean they would quietly sneak into random homes in LA to steal money whilst the occupants slept. Sometimes they wouldn't take money though, sometimes they would just quietly rearrange all the furniture, so the family would just be confused when they woke up. He would listen to the Beatles albums on repeat, particularly the Magical Mystery Tour album. He thought that the Beatles had written this album 
purposely for him. He thought that they were as enlightened as he was. He found messages in the lyrics that weren't really there. He thought they were telling him something, something which solidified when the Beatles released the White Album. He thought the White Album was prophetic, that it was a map to the immediate future. The song Piggies was apparently about the entitlement felt by the rich. Blackbird predicted an uprising for black people. Revolution One was a call to arms. Helter Skelter was the name of the uprising that was about to happen. And again, Helter Skelter is a name, a phrase that has become synonymous with the Manson family. Now, something I failed to mention about Charlie Manson up to this point is that he was a huge racist. To the girls he preached equality and acceptance, peace and love and all of that. He never once let them onto his true views like he did the men. He felt like he could be entirely himself in front of the men who tended to respond better to his power than his sensitivity that the girls saw. Charlie hated black people and he hated the Jewish and he was a lifelong white supremacist. He was convinced that an apocalyptic race war was incoming between the government and black citizens. In particular, the Black Panthers, who were a black power political party. According to Charlie, an undetermined event was going to set off the battle. Black people were gonna kill most of the white and then enslave their surviving white oppressors, which was only fair, Charlie said. Roles would be entirely reversed, but him and his family were safe. Charlie would lead his family to a bottomless pit in the desert where they would hide as the world descended into chaos. After a few hundred years, they would climb out of the hole, having expanded the family to 144,000. Time didn't matter in the hole, he said. According to him, the black leaders would have discovered by this point that they lacked intelligence and organisation skills to run the world, so Charlie and the family would emerge and take over. And this was all possible because Charlie was Jesus reincarnated. Manson dubbed this movement Helter Skelter after the Beatles song. He would preach about Helter Skelter most of the time when his family was on LSD, their minds easily bent. All of the proof, he said, was in Revelation and on the White Album, and his family ate it all up. They believed him because why wouldn't they? He told them that if they left the ranch now, then they would have a terrible fate awaiting them. They would either be killed or made into slaves. He preached this throughout the entirety of 1969, and he just waited for Helter Skelter to begin. He starts stockpiling knives and guns at the ranch, which tells his family, particularly the girls, that they're not allowed to touch them. Meanwhile, Rosemary's baby director, Roman Polanski, and his wife, actress Sharon Tate, had settled into their new home at 10050 Celio Drive, the former home of Terry Melcher. And Gary Hinman, a talented musician, was just leading his normal life. Manson and Hinman had met a few years earlier, they'd really hit it off, and Hinman was known for his open door policy and his very giving nature. But on July 31st, he was found dead in his home, stabbed twice in the heart and badly slashed across the left side of his face. His house had been ransacked and both his cars were missing. Written on the wall in Hindeman's blood was Political Piggy. And that was all down to Charlie Manson. Charlie had been trying to pin down Gary for quite a while. He was a bit of a hippie spirit and he would fit in well with the family, according to Charlie. But Charlie also knew that Hinman had money, but he wasn't loyal to the family. He flitted in and out of their lives. But Bobby Bosley, I remember I mentioned him earlier, very good looking, also had this following of girls uh, who had introduced Charlie to Hinman, provided the perfect excuse to shake down Gary when he bought a thousand dollars worth of mescaline off him. But this mescaline, a type of drug, was bad quality. Beausoleil wanted his money back and he wanted extra for the inconvenience which he would then give to Manson to help with the family's trip into the desert before Helter Skelter. Now Beausoleil was never an actual member of the Manson family but Charlie kept him very very close and therefore he always helped him out when needed always expecting something in return. On Friday the 25th of July, longtime family member Bruce Davis drives Bobby Beausoleil, Mary Brunner and Susan Atkins to Hinman's place, armed with a handgun and a knife. They turn up and they demand their thousand pounds back, but Gary denies having it, even when he's brutally beaten. Eventually, just before midnight that night, Charlie joins them. He slashes a blade across the left side of Gary's head, trying to scare him, 
to no avail. Over the weekend, the beatings continue whilst the family take whatever they can of value from the house. Hinman threatens to call the police when the family eventually leave. Of course, Charlie can't allow this. So he tells Beausoleil, you know what to do, and then he leaves. Beausoleil stabs Hinman in the chest twice, killing him. But whilst he does so, he might as well advance Charlie's prophecy of Helter Skelter as well. Beausoleil tries to frame the Black Panthers for the murder, their paw print symbol left on the wall in Hinman's blood, as well as Political Piggy written on the wall, also in blood. A few days later, police find Bobby Beausoleil napping in the back of Gary Hinman's stolen car, and he's soon arrested for the murder. But it doesn't seem like he immediately implicates Manson or his family in this murder. He remains very, very tight-lipped, possibly on the expectation that Charlie would have to bail him out of jail. Gary Hinman actually wasn't the first murder, or I should say attempted murder, Charlie had been involved with though. Just a few weeks earlier, on the 1st of July 1969, he reportedly went to the home of a man called Bernard Crow and shot him. Crow was an LA drug dealer who had threatened to wipe out the Manson family after Tex had apparently defrauded him. And Charlie obviously wasn't going to stand for this, so he turns up, shoots Crow, but Crow manages to survive. By the end of summer, Charlie was beginning to panic. He told his followers that Helter Skelter was going to begin that summer, but summer was almost over. He was going to have to start it himself, and he announces to his family, now is the time for Helter Skelter. From my understanding, there are two aspects as to why Charlie did what he did, but of course we'll never truly understand the entire motivation behind his actions. So with Bobby Beausoleil in jail, they needed to do a copycat killing to get any suspicion off Bobby. And this actually wasn't Manson's idea, one of the family members came up with it. If another very similar murder happened, the police would have to think that it wasn't Beausoleil who killed Hinman, who's currently sitting in jail. And also, if Manson could pin some more murders on the Black Panthers, it'll kickstart Helter Skelter. And for his next crime, he chooses a house that represents all of the rejection he felt in Hollywood, the former home of Terry Melcher, 10050 Celio Drive. Now, Manson knew that Melcher no longer lived there. After he'd moved out, Manson had gone round the house to confront Melcher, and instead he ran into Sharon Tate and her photographer friend, who quickly removed Manson from the premises, telling him that Melcher didn't live there. So when Manson chooses this particular home as his target that night, he knows that Melcher is no longer there, but the home itself is symbolic enough. Another motivation for choosing this particular place was that Tex Watson had been to a party that Melcher had thrown there before, so Tex knew the home. Because of course, Charlie wasn't going to go himself, somebody had to go who knew this place. On August 8th, 1969, Tex and three female members of the family, carefully chosen Susan Atkins, Pat Kremwinkle and Linda Kasabian, who was expected to be the getaway driver, head to the house. It doesn't seem like the girls were told what was going to be expected of them before they headed off. Only Tex had been given the direct orders. But once they arrive, Tex tells them that they were going into a home to get money from the people who lived there and that they were going to kill them. Susan and Patricia head off with Tex to unquestionably do what was asked of them. But Linda doesn't seem as sure. The home was that of actress Sharon Tate and director Roman Polanski, two successful people in Hollywood. Sharon wasn't hugely known at the time, she'd been given a role in a few different movies and was definitely a rising star. But sadly, we'll never get to know what she could have gone on to do. On the night in question, the 8th to the 9th of August 1969, Sharon was 26 years old and eight and a half months pregnant with her first child, a son. Her and Roman had been married for a year and according to everyone who knew them, they were living in marital bliss. On the night in question, Roman was in London due to return back to LA just a few days later, just in time for the birth of his son. Their baby was due in just two weeks. He would actually asked two of the couple's friends, screenwriter Wojtek Frokowski and Abigail Folger, who was heiress to the Folger Coffee, to stay in the house with Sharon until he returned, just to make sure she was safe. And they happily obliged. Sharon and Roman loved to entertain people at their home. They were always known to be throwing parties and having friends over for drinks. It was rarely a quiet night in, and this night wasn't any different just because Roman was away and Sharon was pregnant. That day, Sharon speaks to Roman on the phone, as well as her younger sister, Deborah, who asked if her and their other sister, Patty, could come and spend the night with her that night. Sharon declines, saying she already has plans, but they should definitely do it another night. 
that's the last time that Deborah ever hears from her sister. That evening, Sharon eats at her favourite restaurant in Los Angeles, El Coyote Cafe, with Wojtek, Abigail and Jay Sebring, who was a close friend of Sharon's and celebrity hairstylist. They return back to her home to continue their evening at about 10.30pm. Shortly after midnight, they are all murdered by the Manson family. When the family arrive, Tex climbs a telephone pole near the entrance gate and cuts the phone line. They then drive the car back down to the bottom of the hill and walk back up to the house, climbing over bushes to get onto the ground. As they're doing so, a car approaches. Tex tells the girls to lie in the bushes as he stops the car. Inside is 18-year-old student Stephen Parent, who had been visiting the property's caretaker in the guest house. Tex shoots him four times, killing him. They push the car further up the driveway, leaving him sat inside. They approach the house to search for an open window, eventually having to cut through a screen to gain access. The first person they come across is Wojtek, who's asleep on the sofa in the living room. He wakes up and asks them what they're doing. Tex replies, saying, I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. They round everyone up into the living room and begin to tie them together with rope that Tex had brought along. Jay protests about how roughly they're handling pregnant Sharon and so Tex shoots him. And it begins, the family stabbing and shooting the residents whilst they attempt to fight back. Linda Xavian is waiting by the gate, drawn up to the house by the terrible screams. She couldn't tell if they were male or female, she just knew it was people screaming for their lives. Wojtek manages to escape out onto the porch before Tex catches up with him and shoots and stabs him repeatedly. He's stabbed. 51 times. Linda falsely tells Susan Atkins that somebody's coming in in an effort to stop the massacre, but it doesn't work. Abigail manages to escape out of the bedroom door to the pool area where she's caught and stabbed by Patricia Kremwinkel. Tex kills her, stabbing her 81 times. Inside the house, Sharon begs for her baby's life, asking if they just keep her alive long enough until she can give birth, and then they can do whatever they want with her. Susan and Tex kill her with 16 stab wounds as she cries out for her mother. Once the massacre is over, they use a towel dipped in blood and write pig on the front door of the house. Linda said she ran back to the car halfway through the attack, wanting to drive away and escape. But she thinks of her daughter who's back at Spahn Ranch and she knows that if she did so, she'd never see her daughter again. On the way home, they change out of their bloody clothes and hide the weapons in the hills. The bodies at Celia Drive are discovered the next day by the housekeeper. The police take in the only survivor at the address, caretaker William Garretson, who lived in the guest house, but he's questioned and quickly released. Roman Polanski is informed and he returns quickly back to LA where he's also questioned by the police, who are struggling to find any kind of motive for this murder. Back at Spahn Ranch, they're all listening to the radio for news reports of the murders. Charlie is excited for the start of Helter Skelter, just waiting for it to be pinned on the Black Panthers and for the race war to finally begin. But this blame doesn't come and Charlie isn't happy with how the murders went anyway, he thought they were sloppy. And so the very next night, the family members set out to kill once again, this time bringing along Leslie Van Houten and Charlie himself. On August 9th, 1969, Susan, Tex, Patricia and Leslie sneak into the home of grocery store executive Lino LaBianca and his wife Rosemary LaBianca. But who were the LaBiancas and why were they targeted? It was actually just kind of random. They had absolutely no connection to Charlie or to anybody else in their family. Their lives were taken simply because they happened to live in the same neighbourhood as somebody the family used to party with occasionally, Harold True. Manson leads his family to this neighbourhood as he knows that it's somewhere that only rich people live and he hated rich people. He chooses the house next door to Harold's as their victims. Both Lena and Rosemary were stabbed to excess, Rosemary 42 times. It just goes to show the state of mind of the murderers. Even once their victims were dead, they continued stabbing. They wrote on the wall in blood, death to pigs and hell to skelter. The word war was carved into Lino's abdomen. Once again, Charlie Manson had nothing to do with the actual murders, but they were done on his word. And there may have actually been a chance that these murders would have gone unsolved. The police had absolutely no leads whatsoever and made no connection to Charles Manson and his family. 
it was months before they had anything and it was kind of just solved by chance. Although the Manson family were now murderers being hunted down by the police, the family didn't actually take any attempts to stop their daily petty crimes and their bigger crimes, like digging their bottomless pit in Death Valley. They'd moved out of Spahn Ranch in August and were now living at Barker Ranch in Death Valley. Whilst they're digging the pit, they actually burn machinery belonging to the Death Valley National Monument. And so the ranch is raided and multiple stolen vehicles are found on site. Everyone at the site at the time is arrested, including Bobby Beausoleil's girlfriend, Kitty Lutzinger. Charles Manson and Susan Atkins are also arrested and 24 people in total are arrested on charges of arson and grand theft. Once the police find out about the connection between Kitty and Bobby Beausoleil, who they know is also sat in jail, they start to pay attention and detectives looking into the LaBianca murders want to speak to Kitty. Kitty tells detectives that Susan Atkins was involved in the murder of Gary Hinman, whilst at the same time Susan Atkins is in a jail cell telling her bunkmates details of the Tate murders. Obviously this all gets back to the detectives and all the pieces of the puzzles begin to make sense. They figure out the story and they begin to collect physical evidence, particularly against Tex and Patricia, such as fingerprints. They obviously couldn't just take Susan's word for it that Tex and Patricia had been involved, they needed something more. And everyone else was pretty tight-lipped, Susan and Kitty were the only ones who actually spoke. Soon after the Tate murders, a nearby neighbour found the murder weapon, which was a very unique 22 caliber revolver on his property, and he quickly turned it into the LAPD. But at the time, they made no connection with this gun to the Tate murders. When this neighbour heard about the breakthrough in the investigation with all these people being arrested, the neighbour actually calls the LAPD just to remind them of this gun that they have in evidence, which they find and they quickly are able to link it to the murders. They issue arrest warrants for Tex Watson, Linda Kasabian and Patricia Krenwinkel. Linda Kasabian hands herself in quite soon after whilst Tex is apprehended in Texas. Patricia had been originally arrested when they raided Barker Ranch, but her father actually bailed her out of jail and Manson ordered her to go back to Alabama, which is where she is re-arrested. Tex, Susan and Patricia are convicted of seven counts of first degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. Leslie Van Houten was charged with two counts of murder and one of conspiracy. Manson, although he didn't personally commit any of the murders, was also charged with seven counts of first degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. As Manson family members spoke to authorities, it became pretty clear who the mastermind behind this was, who was pulling the strings. Now, Linda Kasabian was slightly different. At the time of her arrest, she was actually pregnant with her second child and she openly spoke about what had happened to the detectives. They said that it didn't even seem like a confession coming from her, she just wanted to get it all off her chest. And as she actually never took part in the murders, and this was backed up by what other people were saying, she was granted immunity for a part as a star witness in the case. As you can probably imagine, the trial in this case was a fascinating one. They knew that to be able to convict some of the defendants, they would require testimony from somebody who was present at the murders. So the DA's office eventually reached a deal with the attorney for Susan Atkins. This deal is a promise not to seek the death penalty in return for a testimony before the grand jury, plus consideration of a further reduction in charges for her continued cooperation during the trial. So basically Susan appears in front of the grand jury and tells them that she was in love with the reflection of Charles Manson and that there was no limit to what she would do for him. She describes completely emotionless the events of the Tate murders, of how Sharon pleaded for her baby's life. It's because of this testimony from Susan Atkins that they're able to get the murder indictments for Manson, Watson, Kremwinkel, Atkins, Kasabian and Van Houten. Manson was quick to say in return when he was eventually on trial that Susan Atkins was just a stupid little bitch who wanted attention. This trial had started on July 24th, 1970, when Manson famously entered the courtroom with a freshly cut X on his forehead, saying in his statement that I have crossed myself from your world. This was in response to him not being permitted to act as his own attorney. Manson family members waited outside the courtroom. They cried for their beloved Charlie. They shaved their heads in solidarity with him. 
many would go on to cut crosses into their own heads. Even with Charlie in jail, like this love for him still ran deep. Linda Xabian took the stand as a witness despite an objection that she was incompetent and insane. This objection was overruled and Linda is sworn in. She takes the stand for 18 days, during seven of which she's cross-examined. She was the star witness. This entire trial was pretty much on her back. Manson would scream at Linda while she was in the stand trying to intimidate her, but luckily it didn't work. By the time everything went down, Linda was still a relatively new member of the family. She'd only been with them for about a month so she wasn't quite as indoctrinated as some of the rest, which is probably why she felt able to take the stand. And also she clearly just had more of a conscience. Like I said, Manson still had a huge amount of influence on his family, even from jail. Anybody who defected from the family or tried to talk to the police would mysteriously become injured at the hands of other family members. Um, at one point, the trial was almost completely ruined by President Richard Nixon, who in August 1970, whilst the trial was still underway, said to the media, Here is a man who is guilty, directly or indirectly, of eight murders without reason. The defence used this to try and incite a mistrial, saying that such a presidential statement could influence the jury, which I suppose is understandable, but the jury swear to not allow it to affect their decision, and the trial does continue. Manson's defence in court was pretty much that he had never killed anyone, that his followers had just misinterpreted his talks about Helter Skelter and the death of ego. Charles believed that the ego was the only thing that stopped you from being entirely free in this world. He said his family had become overzealous and committed the murders of their own accord. Charles had nothing to do with it. And Susan, Patricia and Leslie were 100% prepared to take full blame for the killings so Charlie could go on and be free. Imagine being so indoctrinated that you wouldn't just murder to please somebody, you'd then take 100% of the blame. In January 1971, Manson, Susan, Patricia and Leslie were convicted of all counts to murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Tex Watson was tried and convicted in separate trial. Each received the death sentence but was changed later to life in prison when California ended the death penalty just the next year. In 1972, Bruce Davis and Steve Grogan were convicted for the murder of a man called Donald Shea along with Manson. Donald Shea was murdered on August 26, 1969 because Manson believed that Donald had reported them to the police, resulting in a raid on Spahn Ranch. Manson told Bruce, Tex and Steve to ask Donald for a ride and then they went out and murdered him. Years later, in 1977, Steve Grogan drew a map for the authorities to finally find Donald's body, which they did. As of today, Susan Atkins is dead, having died in September 2009 of terminal brain cancer. She applied for parole multiple times, each time rejected. Patricia Kremwinkle is still incarcerated at the California Institution for Women. She was last denied parole in June 2017, the 14th time that she had applied and had been rejected for parole, and she's not eligible to apply again until 2022. Leslie Van Houten has also applied for parole multiple times, 22 to be exact each time denied. She's now 69 and still in jail. Tex Watson is now 73 years old and still incarcerated in San Diego, California, having been denied parole 17 times. He can't apply again until 2021. Nobody wants to be the one to release a member of the Manson family. In fact, the only member of the Manson family to ever have been allowed on parole is Steve Grogan because he helped the police find Donald Shea's body. Charles Manson died in prison aged 83 on November 19th, 2017. Surprisingly, they never gave him parole either. It was noted in prison that he never had any remorse nor any understanding of the magnitude of his crimes. He always stood by the fact that he'd never committed the murders himself, therefore he wasn't guilty. But his psychology is fascinating, as you would expect with somebody who was able to hold that much power and control over so many other people. It's one thing to be a murderer yourself, it's a whole other thing to be able to convince other people to do it for you. And to convince them so thoroughly that it's the right thing to do, that they will stand up in court and take the fall for you, no questions asked. He had this amazing skill for emotionally controlling people, feeding both his and their egos. And even from prison, he continued holding this power. A huge amount of his followers remained loyal to him, still waiting and preparing for Helter Skelter. And I've called it the Manson family throughout this video, but let's call a spade a spade. 
it was a cult. A lot of people have tried to diagnose Manson with a whole plethora of personality disorders and mental illnesses, but as far as I'm able to find, he was never really given an official diagnosis. Some sources say that in prison in his old age, he started to suffer with schizophrenia and paranoid delusional disorder, but this wasn't really his issue when he was leading the family. He had an uncanny ability for being able to pick people, pick people who would blindly follow him, do his bidding without question, pick people who would be able to further his cause, either Helter Skelter or his deep need to be successful in Hollywood. I think the murders were born of his rejection and lack of success in Hollywood, and whilst he would never let that on to his followers, it was too superficial, all he ever really craved was to have a record deal and for people to know who he was and I suppose in one way he did get that in the end. Some of the family members continued on their mission even after his imprisonment, indoctrinated beyond help. Many moved to Sacramento so they could be close to Manson in prison. Lynette Fromm, Squeaky, attempted to assassinate President Gerald Ford in 1975. She was jailed and in 1987 actually escaped from prison in West Virginia to try and reach Manson who she'd heard was suffering from cancer. This was nearly 20 years later and she was still desperately following him. Charles himself of course couldn't have cared less what happened to his family. All three females in prison have since expressed remorse for their crimes saying that they were young and they were completely under Manson's power. And I'm sure that if they'd never come across Manson, they most likely would never have become murderers. But he picked his followers well. He picked them because he knew that they were susceptible to influence. That's why he chose the girls that he did. And that's the story of Charles Manson and the Manson family. I know this has been an incredibly long video and believe me when I say that I barely even scraped the surface of this story. There's so much more to it and I would highly recommend reading the book Manson by Jeff Gwynn as well as Charles Manson Coming Down Fast by Simon Wells. They're both fantastic and so, so detailed. And make sure you check out Magellan TV linked in the top line of the description down below as well. Particularly Manson 40 Years Later, an incredible documentary. You will not regret it. Before I sign off this video, I just want to give a huge thank you to all of you who have signed up to my Patreon. You allow me to continue doing what we're doing here and to hopefully help make a difference. A huge thank you in particular to my $25 plus patrons, Taylor, Joe, Jenny, Jade, Millie and Alexandra. You all know who you are, you're all incredible and I cannot thank you enough for your help. Um, so a huge thank you. Um, all of my links will be down below including all of the sources I've used for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.